Hey, Nick, how you doing today? Doing great, thanks. How about yourself? Epic, thanks. We're so honored to have you on the show. Uh, our folks, our, uh, our audience loves fun, so this is going to be a great one. Nick is part of the fun department and uh, just an all-around great guy and knows a lot about fun and knows a lot about um, how to bring that in uh, to an environment so that you can improve your employees, your customers, and most importantly, your bottom line. Um, as we always do here on Expert Showcase, we start off going through our guest hero's journey. For those of you who this is your first time, the short version is, is that we're going to hear about the beginning, the turning point, and the aftermath of, of Nick's uh, progression into the success that he is today. So Nick, give us a quick overview, maybe 60 to 90 seconds, of your hero's journey. Sure, Chris. So yeah, pleasure to be on the show. Uh, after about 20 plus years in the corporate world um, with a company that had a work hard, play hard culture, I really gravitated towards the play hard part. And I was fascinated by the amazing business results that this company achieved and consistently outperformed their competitors. So my journey then really became, how do I do this? How can I help other companies create this winning workplace culture uh, through fun in the, in the workplace? Oh, that is that is epic, and um, it's so great that you did what a lot of successful people do, which is you know figure out uh, where you're at, figure out what resonates best with you from where you're at, and figure out how to parlay that into a uh, into a successful future. So let's get let's jump right into it. Let's go into the beginning, and let's talk about the be you know the beginning, Mike. And from what you just said, I guess the best place to start is let's talk a little bit about what you were doing in corporate America. Sure. So I was a district sales manager for a, a company, uh, electrical distribution company. So nothing fancy or exotic. They were a very uh, competitive industry. and um, But the company had that, that work hard, play hard culture that I mentioned. And I was really, again, uh, fascinated that you know great retention great morale productivity and ultimately we we outperformed consistently outperformed our competitors so the fun evolved over the course of my career there it started kind of primitive it was drinking beer after work and and, and just good camaraderie but as we matured and the company matured and grew we started to do things that were on company time brief and you know respective of business interruption and consistent so in addition to the traditional things like the holiday party and the summer picnic we started to do these things that were continuous and ongoing so I formed a committee uh, called the circuit club and uh, and then I chaired it for many years and and participated for many years but that's what we did we planned these activities in the workplace and super powerful. The employees would talk about it for months, sometimes years later, and it definitely had an effect on our business. So I really started to wonder, geez, is this unique to our company, this, this electrical distribution company, or could it be that other companies are also doing this successfully? So I started to do some research, uh, a bunch of data started to emerge about ties to increase uh, morale, productivity, creativity, all kinds of benefits of fun in the workplace. But the data was still a little sketchy in terms of the quantitative data. But I had enough to know that there, I was on to something. And I started to look at other industries and sure enough, it didn't matter what the industry was, the high performing companies had this culture of fun. So that was my hypothesis, if you will, at the time that fun in the workplace leads to the business results not the complete opposite as most people would assume that you have fun after you become successful that is very deliberate on the parts of these companies like Google, Zappos, Southwest Airlines companies that you recognize they build it into their culture and achieve these business results yeah, it's interesting because when I first hear what you're talking about is coming from corporate America as well I think back to the time of you know, when they tried to structure team building events and they tried to structure 
Um, you know, the flood, it's funny because the folks, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but you know, Nick and, and the fund department are located in Delaware. They do business all over the world, but they're, they're over in Delaware. I'm here in PA. So we had fun talking about Philadelphia sports before, um, uh, before we came on the air live today. Um, and, and one of the teams we did mention was the Flyers, but I remember for years, the Flyers went away for this team building retreat. Um, to try and build camaraderie. And the funny part is, is Hextall, I mean, for those of you who know Ron Hextall, shouldn't be surprised by this. He came in this year and said, it hasn't been working. We're not going to do it anymore. And I kind of I kind of laughed at it. But I think part of the reason, and, and, and I'm going to make a statement, and there is a question buried in here. I think part of the reason it doesn't work is because it's not part of the culture. It's let's go team build someplace else, but then you come back to work and, you know, things aren't any different. Yeah, you might be friendlier, but it's not more fun. So when you were in corporate America, is that, did you see that distinction where the, the companies who made it a part of their culture were better than the companies who just did this team building event thing? Absolutely, because the team building model in my mind is, is really kind of broken, the traditional team building. So it's, it's usually an event that is designed to you know, motivate, maybe recognize employees. And it really that model is, is a little broken because you have to think of fun as a process, not an event. And so you wouldn't do one thing in any other part of your business and expect results, right? So having the annual holiday party, well, it may not be a bad idea, but it won't generate a culture uh, that's conducive to producing all these business results that, that people would like to have. So when it becomes organic, um, you know, there's, there's a you know, process around doing it, and then it literally becomes natural and organic, not a kind of creepy, you know, let's you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya and pretend like we like each other. Uh, we don't do any of that stuff, by the way. So uh, it's really, our model is very different. Again, brief, consistent, and continuous so that people are experiencing these things all the time. Epic. And, and, and we've taken... No, I was just going to say in the, um, in the beginning phase, because a lot of people, a lot of our viewers are in the beginning phase right now and they either they sense it like they sense that a turning point is coming or um you know they feel that it's something they, they just feel something's not right so from your beginning phase you obviously started to recognize that something was needed and i think that's what all great entrepreneurs have they can recognize that something like you know the, the kevin spacey commercial for e-trade now if anybody's seen it, guys in a shoe store or guys kind of in like a Kohl's department store, they're not a sponsor yet, but they're more than welcome to come on and be a sponsor if they want. Um, and they see everybody buying these these toed shoes and the guy starts looking on his phone and, you know, says, oh, this looks like it's going to be a trend and everything, invests in it, um, that sort of thing. And I think all great entrepreneurs have that. So it sounds like you saw that there was a, either you saw what was working and you did some research or you recognized the need. Give our audience a little bit of background there. Did you see what was working and then do more research, or did you realize there was a need and then see what you could do to fill it? Yeah, great question, Chris. So I was fascinated by this experience that I was having with this company, but I really then started to do a lot of research to figure out if, if this was unique to you know my thoughts and feelings, or you know could it be that there's other people and and you know a body of data around this so when I started to research I stumbled across a guy who is one of the foremost authorities in fun and humor in the workplace a Dr. Paul McGee and much to my delight as I'm looking on his website he's in Wilmington Delaware <laughs> so I call him and I said hey I got this crazy idea for a business I want to deliver fun in the workplace you know would you talk to me for 20 minutes and we met at a local coffee shop. Four hours later, Paul said, Nick, if you don't start this business, I will, because you are the tail end of fish. You know, you're proposing to do what fish, the fish philosophy, and other people have talked about. You know, they validate the, the reason for fun, but they don't actually do it or implement it. So he said, be prepared for a long haul, because not a lot of people are going to buy into this. And of course, I was determined, you know, uh, energetic young entrepreneur I'm gonna make it happen 
So um, yeah, that was really the impetus. Once I knew that Paul and others, you know, validated this concept, I was ready to to blaze that trail. Oh, that's epic! And and I think you've done. I think um, it leads that leads us right into the turning point because you saw the need for something and you saw um, that something other than yourself was required to to make it happen which a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to admit they don't want to look outside themselves they feel business owners i'll say maybe business owners more than entrepreneurs you know entrepreneurs might have a little bit more of a, a spirited attitude but a lot of business owners want to look at everything in, inside themselves um, and feel they have to rely only on themselves. So I give you a, a ton of kudos and a ton of props for, for reaching out and saying, hey, you know, I, you know, I think this is a good idea and you seem to be a, an expert or you are an expert in this. Um, so, and that's, you know, it's one of, that's what our viewers have to do. You know, if you're in the beginning phase and you see the need for something or see the need for a change, start looking at who the top in the industry is and, you know, see if they'll, see if they'll talk to you. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Let's get into the turning point a little bit. Um, in a lot of heroes' journeys, there be, there's something negative that happens that means somebody goes from the ultra success they were, and then they have this real negative or low point. Did you hit a low point, like get fired, laid off, um, you know, anything like that, or was it a self-defined turning point where you said, "I don't want to get to that point. I just need to see things change." Yeah, thankfully, I didn't get to that point where it was uh, something that forced me into into the decision to start my own business. Um, but I did realize, and to your point earlier, that relying or getting help and assistance from other people, I knew that I had some missing pieces or links. So while I had the validation that I was onto something, I'm not someone who can. I'm not the front guy in our business. I don't, I'm not the one that's going to deliver the fund myself. So I called a good, uh, good friend and associate. Many of you will know, and especially um, from the Philadelphia area. But Dave Raymond, who's the original Philly fanatic, and there's a guy who delivered fund very successfully all his life for years. And I shared the idea with David, and he again had this great validation. He said, "Nick, I've been in the sports world for." my entire career but I would really like to be in in the corporate environment and again that was another you know kind of incentive or major milestone for for me to continue on with the business wow the Phil Dave I mean I, I'm I'm still in shock and awe because I mean I grew up watching the Philly Fanatic and this guy if, if our viewers have not seen if you've not heard of the Philly, Philly Fanatic I don't care if you're a sports fan just go search it because he is the best mascot that has ever ever lived so i'm sorry for interrupting you were you were about to tell us you were having this conversation with with david and and, and uh, what was the result of that again yeah so we had several conversations but immediately he was interested he he really saw that there was a, a need and he wanted to diversify his business from the sports and mascot business into the corporate world and we still had a, a couple of missing pieces, right? So I had the sales and marketing down and Dave was going to do the training and he had the model for the way we wanted to deliver it, but we needed some other people. And there's a great story about Dave and I at a minor league baseball game years ago in Aberdeen, Maryland, and we were talking about the business and watching one of his mascots that he created perform on the third baseline. And we were mildly entertained by the mascot, but I looked down the first baseline and the crowd's gone wild and there's this young guy in cargo shorts and a t-shirt on the top of the dugout and he's got the crowd going crazy and I said who is that guy and Dave said oh that's Matt Measley he's the on-field entertainer here he's amazing <laughs> so I said well, that's the guy we need so Dave and I approached him after the game a, you know graduate student at the University of Delaware had all kinds of offers to do all kinds of things in the sports world and entertainment world but he chose to come to work with us. Thankfully, he's the co-author of the book and my business partner, and you know, an awesome young guy. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I mean, and I got to digress for a second because I love Expert Showcase and I love the guests we've had on. We've had Who Wants to Be a Millionaire get uh, winners on. We've had nuclear physicists on. We've had seven-figure business owners on. 
And now we've got a friend of the of the original Philly fanatic. I mean, my life almost can't get any better than this unless my next unless my next wife comes on this show. But anyway, that's besides the point. But I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of awestruck and starstruck at this point. I must admit, and and that's probably not a good thing for a host to be. But the, what I want to tell everybody is is that you got to listen to this guy. <laughs> And before I derail this with all the talk about myself, you got to listen to this guy because, and, and here's why, and I'll interject right in the middle of the turning point. You know, if anybody, like I said before, if anybody knows about fun, it's, it's the original Philly fanatic. And, um, it's, it's, you know, it's what a lot of fun has been, has been, uh, based on in baseball and in a lot of other, in a lot of other areas. And, you throw on top of that somebody who is smart enough to realize where his strengths lie and that he needs to augment them with other pieces to make it a success, you have a winning combination. And that's why Nick is so effective in what he does. And that's why Nat is so effective in what he does. And that's how you can be so effective in what you do. So, um, you know, so we were talking about the turning point and it sounds like the turning, the summary of the turning point was, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, you kind of saw this need, you started to reach out to people and realize that this was a great idea, and you were still lucky enough to have your old job, so it wasn't that you were in a position where you were forced to go do this, but you realized that it was something that you should do, and you had two people were all, who were ultra successful in a, I'll say, a similar business tell you, look, dude, this is a great idea. Um, does that kind of summarize where, where we're at at this point? Sure, sure. And we did solicit some help from corporate uh, America. We had tested our idea with some people that we knew in, in that world uh, to see if it was something that they would be interested in. And, and we, again, got these kind of glowing reviews and interest. And so it's it just another piece of validation along the way and I would encourage any entrepreneur to do the same because sometimes your ideas are great, but if they don't really play out and you can't monetize them in the you know in the real world, then you know you've got more work to do. So we did all that. You know, I consulted with the experts. I I got together, assembled a, a dynamite team, uh, which is still in place today, eleven years later, and uh, we continue to grow that team, and we have great individuals on it. And again, the validation from the customers themselves who said, if you start this business, we will we'll certainly engage your services. Yeah, absolutely. So that really set us up for, for, uh, to start the business. Yeah, epic. And I love what you said there. You did basically what, you know, in, in, um, in other terms, is market research. And you said, hey, I've got this idea. Um, and this was right after the turning point. It's kind of like, okay, we're starting to realize this could, you know, this could turn into something. Let's go off and let's spend some time figuring out if it's uh, figuring out what the interest is there, right? Mm -hmm, correct. Epic. And then it's, I'm going to guess you took the next step, which is the people who said, yeah, will will buy. The minute you had something, you went back to them and said, okay, write me a check, <laughs> right? I mean, you know. <laughs> of course. Of course. And we uh, we spent a lot of time early on designing these programs, and we have a very definite model in science that was created by Dave Raymond originally, and then implemented by Nat Meesley, and it's the same model that we follow today. So it's all in our you know our book, playing it forward, um, but we we have a very definite process. So it needs to be all inclusive. You know, we need to get everybody you know involved in the in the fund. It needs to be non-threatening. Leadership has to buy in. It needs to be on company time. You know, it needs to be consistent. It needs to be brief. So all the th things that we have learned along the way that make for a very successful program, and again make it feel organic within the organization and natural so we we just have developed that over the years we've delivered more fun in the workplace than anyone in the world so we've got we've got some expertise at doing this and now we're playing it forward with uh, with our book and teaching people how to do it internally epic and as soon as we colonize Mars then you can say anybody in the universe and legitimately me in the entire universe but uh... <laughs> But no, the, what, what you brought up there I think is very key for our viewers to understand about the aftermath period, and that is as you're building towards your success, 
you have to understand and kind of keep track of where you're at so you can um, deliver what works and so you can tweak what doesn't work. I mean, you know, when, when you were during your aftermath period, were there things that just didn't, that just didn't work well when you, were, when you were trying them? There were things that we, we tried and, and that, um, you know, a couple things that weren't you know, up to our standards. And I will tell you that Dave Raymond is an absolute perfectionist. You know, he is, it's all about timing. It's all about process. It's rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. So you don't get to be the best mascot of all time by, you know, winging it. So we, we had a very, um, you know, rehearsed and, and, you know, pretty elaborate process to deliver this fun. But we certainly did try some things that didn't work early on quickly moved on and now we literally have thousands of things that we do in, in the workplace that we know work in every environment or we know that work for a certain demographic or we know that work in a certain time frame so we we have that inventory we call it our creative inventory but it's uh, yeah it's after a lot of lot of practice and experience well, and I think that's the big key that our viewers should take away from um, your aftermath period. And, and maybe I maybe I said it a little wrong that it didn't work, but everybody's got to try and experience things because, you know, the first time you do something, it's not going to be as good as the second time or not going to be as good as the, as the third time. Um, there's very few instances where that can happen. I mean, I know what we try and do when we do these videos and we do the show and we do videos for clients is we use a one take philosophy where we just kind of keep rolling. And unless there's a major technical issue, you know, it becomes one take because a lot of times in an environment like this, the first take is the best because it's the raw, it's the natural thing. But in a business like yours, um, I'm quite sure that you're better now than you were 11 years ago. And you have all of those. So you were talking about demographics. It's like you probably have things that work for maybe the millennials that don't work for baby boomers or that don't work for Gen Xers. Um, would that be a fair thing to say? It, it's a, I'm glad you raised the point because one of the very first things that we do with our, our clients is that we take them through a process called the shared experience and it is where we bridge that gap between millennials and baby boomers and various departments and you know uh, educations and all that where we try to find the things that are fun in common for a company for a group uh, for a department so that's really a, a powerful piece that we developed over the years because we realized that yes fun is different for everybody it's different for individuals and it's different for groups of people so we developed this process called the shared experience where we really narrow that down so if you have a group of a couple thousand people you, you know from having two thousand different interests uh, and things that they deem as fun, we can narrow that down to maybe 10 things that are common within that group. So you set yourself up for success that way. So there's no question that there's different likes and, and things for millennials than there are for baby boomers, but we find that common ground and it's it's exciting. That's We, we love that about what we do. Yeah, that's epic. It's funny because I remember I was in a, I was doing a, uh, I was on stage, and um, the audience was millennials, and I forget what TV show I referenced, and I got a, I, I don't even remember what it was, but I got a blank stare, and it, and it hit me like a ton of bricks because as as the show is coming out of my mouth, it's like sometimes I joke around, I'll mention Loretta Lynn or something like that. You and I know who that is, but millennials forget yeah. it. Go 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 Google it. Um, and you know, and I'm like, okay, fine. What, you know, and, and then I'm asking, of course, the stupid follow-up question that I know the answer to, you know, I'm like, well, what shows do you guys like? And like Game of Thrones. And it's like, well, duh. I mean, it's, you know, but, um, you know, Hey, every, every, every time, you know, every, you know, um, even, uh, everybody makes mistakes. So, but I guess the point is, and I really love how you talk about that is the fact that one of the things you learn from your aftermath period in building a successful business is find the common denominator of your client. And when you do, that's where um, that's where everything starts to starts to germinate from, and starts to um, 
starts to grow from because and, and I'm gonna ask you is that do you think and this is the last thing I think this will be the last question in the aftermath before we take a quick break um, do you think by finding that common point do you think it's easier for people to to come together and to realize that whether they're 20 or or 60 they're really the same they're, they really do have common interest at least in some cases yeah, absolutely. Because they they literally are buying into the process. They are co-creating the delivery, what we call delivery, or the activity that they're going to wind up doing together. So we take a repre representative sample of a group or number of employees, and we find these you know these things that are in common, so that they agree, they buy into it, they co-create it with us. So your chances of success you know are escalated dramatically when i was you know back in the day planning fun at you know the old company that i worked for we were just kind of throwing darts at the board right trying to figure out hey i think this would be fun for our our group or our team but at the reality that was my opinion or sally's opinion or another member of the team but when you can get a group of people to come together and say yeah that's cool i like it so um, and they they then will you know, will participate and enjoy the activity. Epic. And um, kind of to, to wrap that up, it almost, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a fear because they're looked at as an expert. At least I know a lot of people I know have a fear that when they're looked at as an expert, they have to have all the answers. And what you have just pointed out is that when you co-create things with your clients, it becomes much more effective unless your client looks at you and says, I really don't care, just do it. You know, whatever you think is best, just go do. But most clients want to be a part of the process at some level. And when they are, they buy in, their people buy in, and everybody has a better time and is more successful. I mean, uh, is, that a, is that a fair thing to say? Hey, for sure. And that's the, been the natural evolution of our business. So while we have engaged with a lot of customers for the whole length of our existence, you know, 10 plus years, they've been, been customers and clients, and that business evolves, they're doing more things themselves internally, and some are completely operating on their own, you know, under our brand, the fund department, or maybe another one that they've selected, but we then consult with them and just help them in the process. So it really happens naturally, and when you can get uh, something to fit activities and, and things that fit within somebody's culture, within their time frame, within their environment, the rate of success goes up dramatically. So we, we, we love when that, again, when that happens, it's part of our process and part of what we recommend that companies do. Epic. Well, this has been a great first half of the show. Um, Nick's had an incredible journey. He's he was, he's one of, I'll say, the fortunate ones to be a very successful person in corporate America, realize that there's something different. And before things turn and change and turn really, turn really negative, he created his own turning point. And now in his aftermath is, you know, is an ultimate success with the fund department. So folks, stick around. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back from the break, we're going to dig deeper into playing it forward and really understand, um, you know, how you can, you know, the whys and the hows and everything behind this. So stick around and we'll be right back. To watch the rest of this epic episode now, click on the link below the video. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Are you still here? What are you waiting for? Watch the rest of this epic episode now by clicking on the link below the video.